Very good. All right. So sit back, relax. Uh, OK, so um, today I want to, uh, in this lecture, I want to finish up telling you um, uh, about a bunch of basic things about quantum mechanics and then extending a little to field theory, all without gravity. Um, although we will talk about curved geometries uh, at the end. In order to uh, set the stage for what I'll talk about in the next lecture, I want to um, review for you the very basic ideas about entanglement, entanglement entropy, what typical very entangled states look like in nature. Um, and then uh, review very simple examples of highly entangled states, the vacuum in quantum field theory, for example, being a prime example of a highly entangled state. <laughs> Um, and then talk about uh, how we can characterize that uh, uh, entanglement by uh, the appropriate density matrices, um, how this relates to Rindler space, black holes, and de Sitter space, all again, all without gravity. And then I also want to tell you how we understand locality in quantum field theory. These are the, these are the things that are going to clash with each other uh, when we turn on gravity. So I just want to I'll talk about them all in the simplest possible setting without gravity first. Um, so I want to talk about how we characterize local theories without gravity, how we do it in the most pedestrian way in terms of uh, 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 the things you've probably seen in, in, uh, in textbooks, and how we see it in a somewhat sharper way that's less familiar in modern textbooks, although it was all the rage 40, 50 years ago in terms of the analytic properties of the S matrix. So all of these things we're going to do in this lecture. And next lecture, we're going to turn on gravity, and we're going to see how everything goes to hell. Um, but we'll see precisely how much it goes to hell. We'll characterize how much the notions of locality are screwed up by, by gravity, at least have a good estimate for it, what the physical effect is. And then we'll see how this violation of ordinary notions of locality uh, can show up not at the Planck scale, but in macroscopic situations when specific kinds of questions are asked. First, in the context of the black hole information paradox. And having understood that, we'll move on to see how that lesson can be extended to the sitter space and ultimately the landscape. But remember, the ultimate goal here is to try to get an understanding of what the heck this huge, infinite picture of eternal inflation, what does that how do we understand that semi-classical space-time? Is it trustworthy to think about that semi-classical space-time? And uh, um, uh, that's what we're going to try to get to at, uh, by, by the end of uh, the next lecture. OK, so let's keep going with simple, simple QM. Um, well, this is something that we saw last time, just in our understanding of why things look classical, decoherence, um, or uh, the measurement problem, is that we can have interesting quantum states uh, which are entangled between two parts. Of, of If we have a big system divided up into a subsystem A and subsystem B, then we can have a general state psi uh, which lives inside A and B. Um, a very special case, if we have something which is just something in A tensored with something in B, then this is not entangled. Uh, but that's not the general situation. The uh, general situation is that there's a sum between states in A and states in B that look like that. And A and B don't even have to have the same uh, dimensionality. Okay, So C is some general matrix. Um, it's a trivial result of linear algebra that we can always diagonalize that matrix. So there's always some basis in which this looks like okay, just the sum of a bunch of uh, C alpha, A alpha, B alpha. Okay, and so if uh, so, in general, 
that is called, uh, this is an entangled state. Now, uh, something, uh, sorry, something I should have said, said first, just before we uh, proceed. If someone gives you any old density matrix rho, okay, no matter where it comes from, okay, there's some basis in which this is a sum over some probabilities i i, and associated with this density matrix, you can uh, associate an entropy. It's minus trace rho log rho. So this is minus the sum of pi log pi. I think it was von Neumann who said, if you want to intimidate a physicist, use the word entropy in a sentence, because none of them know what it means. Okay? And I, if there's some, some truth to that. So I'm going to be very careful in this in these lectures, when I mean entropy, every time I mean entropy, imagine there's actually a density matrix and we're talking about negative trace rule log rule. Okay? <laughs> now what's nice about this, uh, what, what's, what's, what's nice about this is that if we have a pure state, so for a pure state, so here's some, S is equal to zero, because one of the P's is one and the rest of the P's are zero. Also, furthermore, the function p log p is concave up. And therefore, uh, the sum of negative p log p is always bounded by the dimensionality of the Hilbert space. Okay. So, and so this is, so this is obtained when rho is equal to 1, 0, 0, 0 in some basis, a pure state. And n is obtained when rho is so-called maximally mixed. 1 over n, 1 over n, 1 over n. OK? All right. Now let's go back to talking about entanglement. When we have a general entangled state, as we saw last time for the special case of system and environment or system and apparatus, it's useful to talk about the density matrix, let's say, just that system A would see, which is the trace over B of psi psi, and similarly, rho sub B, which is the trace over A of psi psi. And once again, rho sub A and rho sub B uh, don't even have to be the same dimensional matrix, right? They can live in different size uh, Hilbert spaces. <laughs> But a measurement of how much entanglement there is between these two systems is obtained by taking the entropy associated with these density matrices. Okay. So let's say SA is negative trace rho A log rho A. Okay. But interestingly, and rather obviously, this is also equal to SB. Uh, that's obvious because of the fact that there's a basis where it looks like this. Okay. So, so um, uh, S A is a sum of C mod squared log C mod squared, and so is S B. Okay. And because these entropies are the same, then they're they're given uh, a symmetrical name. They're called it's called the entanglement entropy between the subsystems A and B. Okay. If S entanglement is zero, then there's no entanglement. And if S entanglement is maximal for one of the sub subsystems, let's say, I don't know, let's say NB is greater than or equal to NA, then S entanglement is bounded by NA, of course. And if it's equal to NA, then this is maximally entangled. OK, any questions about this? Yes. Where? I'm sure I do. Where? Login. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. 
Right. How are you Oh, if you have a general M by N matrix, you can always diagonalize a general M by N matrix by unitary transformations on the right and the left to make it diagonal. That's what I've done. Yeah, it runs over the lower one. So if you have a general M by N matrix, you can always diagonalize it so it looks like. And so that's a general simple fact about linear algebra. OK, thank you. It's bounded by log. OK, now let's, let's talk about some typical entangled systems. See, in fact, um, entanglement is what's responsible for, uh, and large amounts of entanglement is what's responsible for things we know to be pure states actually looking highly thermal or highly mixed when we look at parts of the system. So, uh, and this is an example that people often talk about when talking about the information paradox. There's the proverbial lump of coal. Okay. And so you have a little lump of coal sitting here in its ground state. And then you zap it with photons. So this is some initial pure state. Coal, tensor, two photons coming at it with very high energy. Then you heat, it, you heat up the coal. And what happens? The coal, then, the coal then emits lots of infrared radiation okay. until eventually there's a lot of radiation come back down again. The coal is sitting there again. And there's all kinds of uh, what looks like thermal radiation coming down. Okay. Now, it just looks thermal. But you know it's not really thermal, because this is just ordinary quantum mechanics. I start with a pure state. Okay. Of course, in this intermediate, in this intermediate time, um, let's say I'm only looking at photons outside. I'm only looking at the Hilbert space of photons outside. Well, clearly, so this initial state was a nice pure state of tensor product. Now there's going to be some interesting entanglement between these photons uh, outside and different states of the various coal molecules inside here. Eventually, the coal goes back to its ground state. I have then another state with a lot of photons outside. But that other state with a lot of photons outside um, has got to be a pure state again because I'm just a unitary evolution of one giant state. Okay. So how is it possible that I start? So, so if I ignore this intermediate step, it looks, like I'm taking, it looks like I'm taking a pure state. And what comes out is, of course, also a pure state. But somehow, it looks damn thermal. How is it possible for a pure state to look damn thermal? It's, in fact, very easy. It's generic for a pure state to look damn thermal. And let me just. Uh, let me just give you a very simple example. Um, this generically happens when you have large Hilbert spaces. And you have typical states in large Hilbert spaces. So let's do a simple example. Let's say we have n spins. Okay. And I'm going to consider the following state. The sum over all the spins, sigma i, 1 over root 2 to the n, sigma 1 up to sigma n. Okay. But I'm going to put here a phase that depends on sigma 1 to sigma n, which is random. So this is a nice pure state. This has a bunch of random phases in it, but it's evidently a nice pure state. Now, it's very easy to see that if I look at any subset of this n-dimensional Hilbert space, if I choose to look at k of the spins, then we'll see. So let's say I choose to look at k of the spins. What is the density matrix for looking at, let's say, the first k spins? Okay. Well, it's the trace over the other n minus k spins of psi psi.
Okay, so this is the sum, so let me just uh, write it out. It's a sum over sigma one. What I'm saying is obvious, but let me just be a little pedantic here. Sigma one, sigma n, sigma one prime, sigma n prime. Sigma one up to sigma k. Sigma one prime up to sigma k prime. One over two to the n. Uh, but now I am tracing over, uh, so now I'm, I'm tracing over everything else. So that's going to give me uh, a factor of 2 to the n minus k, first of all. Then there is a, uh, sorry, no, no, let me just be, be explicit. It's e to the i theta of sigma 1 up to sigma k and sigma k plus 1 up to sigma n. Uh, minus theta of sigma 1 prime up to sigma k prime, sigma k plus 1 up to sigma n. And it's the sigma k plus 1 up to sigma n are the same here because I'm taking the trace over the remaining n minus k spins. Now, it's clear that there's a piece of the sum here where these spins are the same as these ones. With sigma 1 prime, the sigma primes are the same as the sigmas. So let me pull that piece out. That'll just give me a 1 over 2 to the k times the sum of sigma 1 up to sigma k, sigma 1 up to sigma k. And I, since I'm summing over all the rest of these guys, I pick up the 2 to the n minus k, and that, fact, and that cancels the 1 over 2 to the n to turn into 1 over 2 to the k. So that's what I get for the diagonal piece. And these phases exactly cancel out for the diagonal piece. What do I get for the off-diagonal pieces? Now, the off-diagonal pieces, uh, I have to sum over all, for any one off-diagonal piece, I have to sum over 2 to the n minus k random phases. Okay. Now, what's going to happen to you sum over 2 to the n minus k random phases? They're going to average to 0. Okay. And in fact, we can be a little more specific. They average to 0 as 1 over square root of the number, Okay. It's whenever you average n things. So this is plus order 2 to the minus n plus k over 2, n minus n minus k, OK? 2 to the minus n plus k over 2 for the off diagonal terms. OK, so we can see that if k is much smaller than, uh, so sorry, what am I doing? 2 to the n minus k over 2. There we go. Okay. So we can see that as long as k is much smaller than n, so if k is much smaller than n, this state looks maximally mixed. Right? Rho k looks maximally mixed. And the entanglement entropy that I get from it is log k. So if I think of this big state as being entangled between the first k spins and all the rest of the spins, then, the, then if I look at just the k subsystem, it looks maximally mixed, the entanglement entropy is log k. Only when k starts becoming comparable to n do you start seeing that the state is actually pure. And when, and when k is not equal, and, and notice that, that the, the entangled entropy as a function of k looks like it's k, 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 and then rapidly, exponentially, it shuts off to 0 when k starts becoming comparable to n. Okay? So it's a very dramatic effect. When k is parametrically smaller than n, totally maximally mixed. When k becomes n over 2, you know, 2 thirds n, it very rapidly starts becoming starts becoming pure. This is an effect that turns on exponentially rapidly. So what do we learn from this for this example? Um, what we learn from it is the reason why this pure state looks thermal is because you know, a bajillion photons came out. And if we measure only a million out of the bajillion photons, it'll look completely thermal, totally mixed. Okay? 
how can we see that the whole state is pure? We can only do it if we measure almost every photon that came out. OK? Roughly speaking, you begin to see that it's pure when you measure half of them. Okay. But as long as you're talking about a subsystem that's parametrically smaller than the whole Hilbert space, a typical state will look maximally entangled. So this is why heating up a lump of coal and watching it radiate away and go back down to its initial state is, can be a unitary process in quantum mechanics, despite the fact that the final state of the photons coming out seems to be thermal. By the way, uh, I keep using the word thermal. Here it's maximally mixed. If you literally want it to be thermal, um, uh, the sort of state that looks thermal If you have a large, again, if you have a large Hilbert space and you look at the state psi, which is a sum over all the energy eigenstates, e to the minus beta over 2 en, e to the i, some random phase as a function of n en. Okay. So a typical large quantum system has very, very degenerate energy levels. Okay? Very, very degenerate energy levels. And if you take the following kind of state, so there will be many, many energy levels with comparable E. But if you weight them all with E to the minus beta over 2 En in a random phase, this is a state that when you look at any subsystem, will have rho entangled given by E to the minus beta H. Okay? And it'll look actually through. All right, any questions about this? Yes. Right. Sorry? If we really look at all the states, all the photons that we want, and all of them behave in that way. No, 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 this is another example where this is a pure state. But if you look at if you look at a sufficiently small subsystem, it'll look like the effective density matrix is thermal. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, I should say approximately. Okay. So I'm just saying this is a generalization of this little example that I, that I gave you. In both cases, we're talking about pure states in a giant Hilbert space. So the, the basic lesson is giant Hilbert spaces can do funny things. Okay? When you look at a pure state in a giant Hilbert space, if you look at small subsystems, they can look thermal, maximally entangled, okay? despite the purity of the whole state. And to see the purity, you have to measure everything. So you know when people use the words that the information is encoded in subtle correlations between the photons coming out of the lump of coal, this is what they mean. Okay, those words are associated with this small mathematical fact that Don Page pointed out in 1993. Very good. Now um, let's talk about some other. Uh, systems with the entanglement. Of course, by the way, when we talk about entanglement, implicitly, we're, we're imagining, well, explicitly, uh, for things to be entangled, uh, we're, we're, we're imagining breaking up the system into two parts, or many parts. So when I say state is entangled, uh, I have to tell you entangled with respect to what sub, sub, subspaces. But here's a very pretty example. Let's take the vacuum in quantum field theory. So you have a massive scalar field. And let's just look at the vacuum state in QFT. Let's say we have a massive scalar field or something. Its vacuum state is very entangled in position space. Okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, you know that it's entangled in position space because uh, the, uh, the ground state wave function uh, has correlations between what happened at two different points. In fact, the correlation function, or the two-point function, is exactly a measure of that correlation. Okay? Let's say this a little more formally. 
Uh, for some reason, we don't talk about this so much in the field theory textbooks. Um, but there's a Schrodinger picture wave function for phi, right? Um, what is it? Well, you know, for a harmonic oscillator, it's e to the minus omega x squared, right? That's what the ground state, ground state wave function looks like in the position basis. Field theory is just a bunch of harmonic oscillators with uh, x replaced by phi sub k, where these are the momentum modes. So what is this ground state wave function? It's just the product over all the k's times this harmonic oscillator wave function for each one of them, e to the minus omega k phi k squared. Okay, so that's the ground state wave function in field theory, which is e to the, also e to the minus the integral d d minus 1k omega k phi k mod squared. Okay? Which is, however, this is local in momentum space, but it's therefore not local in position space. Okay? This is also e to the minus the integral of some phi of x, some kernel phi of y. Okay? So manifestly, the ground state wave function does not factorize into something times something here, something there. It has correlations. Let's see if we can see that a little more vividly. Let's just do an example. Suppose I'm talking about the, suppose I'm talking about, uh, here's time and space, but I'm not going to care about the time for the moment. I, I'm, I'm taking a spatial slice. Okay, here's just t equals zero spatial slice. But suppose I'm only interested in looking at half of the space, this part of the space, and not the other half. Okay. So this is my first sub sub subsystem left, and the next subsystem right. The ground state, once again, the ground state wave function is definitely not of the form something left, something right. That's just what we said. Okay. Again, if it was, phi of x left, phi of x right would equal just phi of x left, phi of x right, which is not the case. Okay. So therefore, there's some entanglement between the right and the left. And we can ask, what is the density matrix just on the right? Okay. So this is the trace over the left of ground ground. Okay. Now, we'll see in a second that, uh, well, so this is going to be some density matrix. And we're going to compute it, but we're going to compute it by taking a little detour. We could, of course, just do it brute force. Okay, it's not hard to do it. Uh, it's not hard to do it. It, it is actually hard to do it. <laughs> brute force. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I've done it. Um, but uh, let's 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 take a little detour. It's actually easy to motivate the detour, even from the problem that we're trying to solve. But let me phrase it in a more standard way in terms of the uh, detour. Our detour is into Rindler space. Okay. Um, by the way, why do we care about this? We're going to care about this in the next lecture because this fact that there's entanglement between different parts of space when you talk about even the ground state in quantum field theory means that when you have regions of space-time that are separated by horizons, you see here I'm just erecting an artificial wall and saying, I only care about what's going on in this region of space. When there's horizons, there is a wall. I mean, there isn't a wall, but there's a more natural separation of the space-time into two parts. And the fact that there's entanglement is what's responsible for the thermal character of horizons. Okay? So that's, 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 that's why we care. All right. So let's let's talk briefly about uh, about Rindler space. Uh, how many of you have gone through everything to do with Rindler space in your life? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Eva. <laughs> 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 
David, you didn't put up your hand. Just shame on you. That... <laughs> Very good. Um, OK. So um, let's, uh, I'm going to just work in 1 plus 1D. And actually, let's start in 2D, Euclidean space. And you know, we have rotational invariants in Euclidean space. But when we write the metric as dx squared plus dy squared, that rotational invariance is not as transparent as it could possibly be. Okay? So what do we do to make the rotational invariance transparent? We go to polar coordinates. Okay? And now in polar coordinates, the rotational invariance is totally manifest as theta goes to theta plus constant. Okay? So that's x equals r cos theta, y equals r sine theta. Now let's do one plus one dimensional Minkowski space. The metric is dt squared minus dx squared. This has Lorentz invariance, but the Lorentz invariance isn't completely manifest. So what do we do to make the Lorentz invariance manifest? We do the same thing. We introduce the analog coordinates, which obviously have to be x equals rho cosh tau and p equals rho cinch tau. And in terms of these coordinates, the s squared then becomes just the exact analog. Uh, it becomes d tau squared. It becomes um, rho squared d tau squared minus d rho squared. Okay. And the Lorentz on this variable tau. The Lorentz transformation is now just tau goes to tau plus constant. This is Lorentz. That's the Lorentz boost. OK, so let's uh, see what this looks like more geometrically. So if I have uh, t and x, Let's see what's what's covered by x equals rho cosh tau and t equals rho cinch tau. Well, if I'm sitting here at uh, some value of rho and tau equals zero, then this is x and t, and then I can just boost that point. Okay. So this line is tau equals zero. That's tau equals one. Tau equals minus one. And this is, you know, rho equals one, rho equals a half, I don't know, okay? Rho equals two, and so on. Okay? Rho equals zero is that, that wedge. Now, physically, uh, if we look at um, lines of constant rho, um, lines of constant rho correspond to uniform acceleration uh, with acceleration given by 1 over rho. Okay. And that's, that's actually easy to see. Let's just expand for tiny tau. Okay, when things are clearly non-relativistic, for tiny tau, x is equal to rho plus uh, a half rho tau squared, while t is equal to rho tau. So x is equal to rho plus a half t squared over rho. And so therefore, this is uniform acceleration non-relativistically with acceleration equal to 1 over rho. OK? And it makes sense. So here we are, an observer here, you know, there, this trajectory looks parabolic around here. But then as they accelerate more and more, they can't go faster than light. So they have to asymptote to these lines. And in fact, this trajectory corresponds to some guy who is moving really fast 
slowing down and then getting accelerated back in the opposite direction. Okay? That's this. Okay. So this is just a part of Minkowski space. But if, if we were these uniformly accelerated observers, um, then these uniformly accelerated observers see this metric. There are parts of the space time they can't see, okay? Because they're, because they're accelerating. A signal set from here will never reach this guy. So there's a horizon for these observers. Okay? And um, finally, so, so We can ask, uh, you know, we can draw many simple pictures here. Uh, for example, let's say that there's someone else who isn't accelerating, who's just happily sitting at rest in Minkowski space. Okay? And this guy is sending light signals to their friend. Okay? There are some critical time at which well, for this guy, past some time, these light, light signals that he sends will never get out. But this guy, forevermore, for their entire life, will see signals from this guy. Okay? It's just that the time interval between signals will start appearing longer and longer and longer to this guy. So in fact, if we say that this observer, so its x observer is rho cos tau, t observer is rho sinh tau, while x light, if I'm sending light from this point, of t is t plus delta t, then, um, then this guy will receive the signal at a time tau given by log just because of these cautious and cinches, log rho over delta t. So if delta t is the time interval between uh, sending signals, then it takes logarithmically longer and longer and longer uh, for the guy outside to see them. Okay. So this is interpreted. So I've just drawn the picture in the full Minkowski space. This guy, in this metric, interprets it as the red shifting as they approach the horizon, rho equals 0. So to be clear, this is a completely kinematical horizon. Right? It's just, uh... but it's very important to understand Rindler space inside out because every non-extremal horizon in gravity, in the near horizon limit, is Rindler space. Okay. Um, <coughs> so that's why this 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 dynamics is totally universal, and it's important to understand what is going on. Okay. Now, what does Rindler space have to do with the question that we were asking? Um, well, notice, remember, uh, we were asking the question of what does the, what does the density matrix look like on the right part of a space? And here, we we're just choosing just because we're interested. Okay? Well, the Rindler observer can never see the left part of the space. Okay? So for the Rindler observer, this density matrix is actually something interesting. Okay? This is all they will ever see. Okay? So the fact, so and the underlying Minkowski space vacuum will be interpreted by the Rindler observer as some density matrix. Okay? And furthermore, Notice something else. Note that this, uh, I'll just write it again. So tau is the Rindler time here. This metric isn't, is explicitly time independent. Okay? It's row dependent, but it's time independent. So associated with tau translations is a Hamiltonian, which we'll call the Rindler Hamiltonian. How translations are carried out by some Hamiltonian. Of course, secretly in the full underlying Minkowski space theory, this Hamiltonian has another name. 
What is another name for it? What is it that, exactly, it's a boost, okay? What takes you from tau to another tau is a boost, okay? So the Rindley Hamiltonian is actually the boost. But the fact that we have a Lorentz invariant vacuum, the full Minkowski space uh, uh, ground state is Lorentz invariant. And the fact that this uh, Rindler Hamiltonian is the boost, actually, is, uh, is going to allow us, without doing any work, to completely constrain the form, a general form, for this density matrix. And then we'll be actually be able to compute it in a second. Okay? So now if we look at this picture again, we're, we're concentrating on this wedge. There's also a symmetrical wedge on the other side. And if I were to literally take this full spatial slice and boost it, it would go here, OK, or there. Now, we know that if I take the full boost acted on the ground state, that I get 0. I also know that I can think about this boost, though, as being the Rindler Hamiltonian on the right minus the Rindler Hamiltonian on the left. Okay? There's a minus sign on the left simply because a boost here increases tau on one side and decreases it on the other. Okay? This alone tells me that the ground state must be of the form. It is not of the form something on the left, something on the right. We concluded that already. But it must be of the form some sum of some function of dn, where these are the Rindler energies of the en on Rindler, en on the left, tensored en on the right. We know that because the ground state is Lorentz invariant, and it's annihilated, therefore, by h right minus h left. So in the sum, these energies have to be equal to each other. So the ground state of Minkowski space is an entangled state. And when we write it in terms of eigenstates of the boost operator, or of the Rindler uh, Hamiltonian, it's a very simple entangled state. And furthermore, if we therefore look at the density matrix on the right, this is then sum over n, sum f of en mod squared, en, en. Or it's some function of the Rindler Hamiltonian on the right. OK? Commutes with the Rindler Hamiltonian. Yes. Spatial slice. So, so, so we have uh, we have this is the left part of the space. That's the right part of the space. Okay. No, no. This is in the full Minkowski space. Okay. Now, however, uh, the Rindler observer that lives in the right wedge only ever sees the right part of the spatial slices, and the left side only ever sees the left part. Oh sure, uh, yes, a regular, well, a regular inertial observer with spatial slices that look 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 like that. Indeed, this is just a trick. I mean, so th this is the, uh, first of all, physically, if you cared about the Rindler observers, this is what they would see. But independent of that, as you'll see, it's also uh, this is very nice because we knew that this spatial slice, independent of any way you do time evolution or anything like that, that spatial slice. The state on that spatial slide is entangled between the left and the right. And this way of thinking about it gives you a very nice way of seeing what that entanglement looks like. Okay? So things, things are entangled in a way that the density matrix is a, simple, is a simple function of the Rindler Hamiltonian or the Lorentz boost. 
OK, very good. Now we're going to work out actually what this function is. Okay, so this function, f of the n mod squared, turns out to be just e to the minus pi. Okay. By the way, uh, I should say this variable tau is dimensionless. So the Hamiltonian h here is dimensionless. Of course, to convert to what you would physically call the, uh, the dimensionful energies or times or whatever, you have to use rho. Okay, so at any given place, remember the acceleration is one over rho. But uh, the tau that we defined was dimensionless. The h is dimensionless. So this is, uh, this is why this formula makes sense. But this has the interpretation that the density matrix is thermal. It's thermal with respect to the Rindler Hamiltonian. Okay, with temperature pi. Or more physically, the temperature would be pi over rho as experienced by an observer uh, at that particular value of rho. OK. Now, the way we see this is, um, uh, so as I said, it is possible to do a direct computation. Um, uh, but it's not particularly illuminating. Um, whereas there is a beautiful way of doing the uh, calculation, which is very illuminating. OK. Um, before we do that, let me, uh, let me remind you about something. That in, in quantum mechanics, and uh, if you're trying to determine the ground state wave function, the ground state wave function is always given by a Euclidean path integral. The ground state wave function is given by a Euclidean path integral. Uh, let, let me do it in field theory from the get-go. That's, 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 that's this one. So the ground state wave function is given by a Euclidean path integral, but only over half of a space. So, uh, so imagine doing the Euclidean path integral not over all of space time, uh, but over all space with a boundary, and you fix the value of phi. So let's say I want psi at phi star. You fix the boundary value of phi to phi star at the boundary. Okay. So, so you do the Euclidean path integral over this semi-infinite part, over fields living in this semi-infinite part of space, restricting the value of the field to phi star at the boundary. Why is this the answer? It's simply because uh, uh, this is uh, this is because if we look at if we look at the If we look at this object at large t, this is just phi final uh, ground ground phi initial e to the minus e ground t plus tinier corrections from the higher excited states. When I when I insert a complete set of states here, I have a contribution from the ground plus all the higher order ones. With the higher order ones have bigger energy, so at large t, I'm just dominated by this one. And so this object, let's say I fix phi i uh, to have any old value I want. Okay? If I look at the dependence of this object on phi f, that tells me what the ground state wave function is. Do you see that? And I encourage you to do this little, little exercise just for the harmonic oscillator, where you get the right answer. Okay? And of course, this is what's computed by the Euclidean path integral. So this is integral d phi with phi equals phi initial 
and phi final on the boundaries of e to the minus s Euclidean. But since I don't really care about, I only need one of them to find the uh, ground state wave function, forget about the other one. I put some canonical boundary conditions, the fields vanish at infinity, something. And I just want to keep track of the dependence on, on, on uh, one of the boundaries. OK? OK. So now let's go back and see if we can uh, Now let's 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 go back and just directly compute what the what rho is on the right. Rho on the right, so remember I, I'm interested, let's forget about Rindler space and everything now. Let's go back to this question. I'm interested in what is the density matrix on the right here. Okay. Well, I get this by doing, I have to do the trace over the left. This is trace over the left of uh, ground ground. So let me be more specific. If I want to know the row right between some value phi r and phi r prime, okay, then this is equal to the trace is just integrating over all values of phi left okay, times the ground state wave function star of phi left and phi right prime, the ground state wave function of phi left and phi right. Okay. So it's the same value of phi left because I'm doing the trace again. OK? Now we're going to give a little pictorial representation for each one of these two pieces, side ground star and side ground. Let's start with side ground. Side ground at phi left and phi right is doing the path integral, fixing the value of phi to be phi right here and phi left here. So I'm doing a path integral, integral d phi, e to the minus s Euclidean of phi with these boundary conditions. Okay? This gives me, this is psi ground of phi left and phi right. Now, immediately above it, I'm going to draw, putting a little space just to remind me, but I'm going to really imagine we're going to glue them to each other in a second. It doesn't really matter where I put it. This is phi left again. This is phi right prime. And I'm going to do the Euclidean path integral e to the minus s Euclidean of phi with the boundary conditions that it's phi right prime and phi left here. OK? And that gives me psi ground star of phi left and phi right prime. Now, let's look at this sucker. We want to integrate furthermore over d phi left. Okay? So integrating over d phi left is just equivalent to integrating over the value of phi here. Okay? So actually, we see something else. We see that. Uh, Integral d phi left uh, psi ground star. Well, so rho, what we actually want, rho of phi right prime and phi right is equal to, it's equal to the following path integral. Now the path integral over all of Euclidean space. With the value of phi on the top part of the sliver given by phi right prime and on the bottom part of the sliver given by phi right. OK? All right, but there's a very natural way to, to do this path integral. 
Okay? Instead of trying to do the whole path integral like this, let's try to do the path integral by first integrating from here to there, then doing that little sliver, then doing that little sliver, that little sliver, that little sliver, and taking it all the way around. Okay. So what is the Euclidean path integral that takes you from here to there? Okay. Well, that is e to the minus the angle times the operator that rotates you in Euclidean space, times the rotation operator in Euclidean space. Okay. But that's nothing other than e to the minus the angle times the Rindler Hamiltonian. Okay. Is that clear? So if, so in other words, if someone asks you to compute e to the minus epsilon times the Rindler Hamiltonian between two states, then that has a Euclidean path integral interpretation, which is exactly the integral between this radial, the, the integral over this little uh, radial slice of the Euclidean space. Okay? So this answer is nothing other than going from here all the way around a 2 pi rotation by the Rindler Hamiltonian. Okay? So this is e to the minus 2 pi h Rindler between phi right and phi right prime. And that's why rho is equal to, so as claimed, rho is thermal. And notice this has nothing to do with free field theory. We don't have to compute any bug Lyubov coefficients. This is a totally general fact. Okay. So rho on the right is equal to e to the minus 2 pi h I, I may have written pi before. I meant the f's themselves are e to the minus pi, the f mod squared is e to the minus 2 pi. So the temperature is 2 pi over rho. I'm sorry, I screwed up. OK. So this tells us that um, the vacuum in Minkowski space vacuum has, an, has entanglement. And if I want to see what's going on in the, the effective density matrix in one part of the space, uh, is mixed and is in fact exactly thermal with respect to the Rindler boost Hamiltonian. Okay? Now, this means physically that the observers, that uh, observers moving along constant row trajectories will experience physics as if there is a temperature and the temperature is 2 pi over rho. And I want to go through a little bit, just give you a little bit of intuition. This was a little formal. I want to give you a little bit of intuition for why this is, okay? Because it's crucially associated with the presence of the horizon. Um, and I just want to give you the sort of uh, physical intuition for why it is that the observers see finite temperature. This is important because, again, I want you to see, first of all, that horizons are associated with temperature. And that temperature is, and the whole the thermo, thermality is a reflection of the entanglement between things on one side and the other side of the horizon, which we see as clear as day in this example. There's nothing deep going on here, right, guys? It's Minkowski space. Um, but uh, nonetheless, this has the germ of almost all the interesting thermal properties that uh, people talk about in fancier situations. OK, so why does it look thermal? Well, uh, let me give you first a little bit of a, uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to say a bunch of loose things now. Okay. Um, so does it really look thermal? Um, how would you check that there's a thermal spectrum? This is really saying there's a thermal spectrum of everything, right? This observer would see, you know, if the temperature was bigger than the mass of the electron. Uh, they would see a roiling sea of E plus T minus pairs, for example. Yeah, everything will look actually thermal. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, no. They 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 see it's not a flux from somewhere. They see uh, they see. Uh, 
Right. That's right. That's right. In this, in this, uh, in this, that's the row. Okay. It just looks like there's there's just a thermal bath. Okay. okay. So, well, how would you check? How would you check that there's a roiling C of E plus E minus pairs? Well, you might want to send out a photon and see if the photon bangs into something and returns. Okay? So now what, when we do this in Minkowski space, let's say, I mean, sorry, we are in Minkowski space, but when, I, when I'm a normal inertial observer in Minkowski space, I send out a photon and it just keeps going forever. Okay? It doesn't hit anything. I don't see anything. Of course, we really know that this photon is going out and constantly turning into E plus E minus pairs, fluctuating in and out. But the fluctuation is happening rapidly and averages out into just the photon taking off. OK? The crucial reason why we see anything thermal is this feature of horizons that things get infinitely redshifted as you approach them. OK? And so virtual processes that are very fast in some inertial frame get slowed down tremendously and finally appear as real processes. Uh, so for example, what happens to the Rindler observer is the following. So here's the Rindler observer. Boom. All right, they send out a photon. Here the photon converts to an E plus E minus pair. Okay. Now, the photon is converting to an E plus E minus pair just like this in space time, right? That doesn't know about the, doesn't know about this observer, doesn't know about anything. Okay? But now see what happens. Uh, so let me let me draw the picture more like this, actually. Just just well, I, we can draw it anyway. Okay. Um, see, the virtual pair is getting created here, but because of this acceleration that keeps this guy going forever and ever, and because of the presence of the horizon, that pair doesn't reconnect until behind the horizon. So the Rindler observer never sees them reconnect. Okay? And that's why their attempt to see, is there any plus E minus pair? Oh, yeah, there is. Okay? This, and it's because we're taking these very fast virtual processes that average out, and we're slowing them down immensely as they approach the... Uh, uh, as they, in fact, ultimately infinitely as they approach the uh, the horizon. In fact, this even gives us a quantitative, a, a semi-quantitative way of seeing why the answer has got to be thermal as well, because um, well, let, let me not not, not get into that. Um, let's do another a, a more a more uh, dramatic example. Um, Lenny Susskind did all sorts of nice thought experiments uh, like this with the uh, uh, Rindler space. One of them is uh, Susskind's bucket. So imagine you take a bunch of uh, protons, you stick in the bucket, uh, and you're an observer at one value of rho. Let's say one of our rho is our scale. Okay? But you lower the bucket to, so, so that the temperatures start approaching the gut scale. Well, OK, you know what the gut scale? There's um, things are getting very hot, and eventually there's, for example, proton decay. There's no reason why barren number is conserved. You lower the bucket towards the Rindler horizon. Okay. So you lower the bucket towards where equals zero. You lower the bucket and you bring it back up, and the barons are all gone. How did that happen? Okay, you're just sitting here in Minkowski space. How the hell did, 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 did this happen? Well, first of all, it's not that crazy because the act of lowering the bucket. Lowering the bucket and keeping it there right, takes a huge amount of work because that bucket is now trying to accelerate at some enormous, enormous rate. So you, you're working incredibly hard to make sure the bucket doesn't. Uh, so, so first of all, there was a source of energy. Okay? But secondly, but let's, let's just look how, uh, how it works uh, in, in this sort of picture again. It, the way protons decay in guts is that the quarks turn into leptons by emitting heavy gauge bosons, X and Y gauge gauge bosons. Okay. And again, this is a virtual process that's happening all the time. It's happening now. It's happening everywhere. The, the quark emits a virtual X and Y turns into a lepton, but this comes back again, turns into a quark, and this is happening on incredibly fast timescales of order the guts get. Okay. 
So, but why is it that we see, why is it that we can see uh, a big baron number violation in, in Rindler space? It's because of exactly the analogous thing that I drew before, that when I have a quark here and it's emitting the virtual X and it turns into a lepton and then back into a quark again, okay, the Rindler observer never sees them reconnect. Okay. The Rindler observer just sees the quark split into an X and a lepton, and that's it. It's gone. Okay. They never see it reconnect, and so they see baryon number violation. And once again, it's the same physics that, that the presence of the horizon is redshifting all the physics associated with high energies, short times, uh, to be visible to the, uh, to the accelerated observer. OK. Yes. Sorry? Oh, I'm, I'm drawing this picture in position space. And in fact, you, 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 you should really learn to think about quantum field theory in position space as much as possible. Um, uh, uh, I think, I, think, I think it's Lenny who has a nice saying that only perverts think in momentum space. And it's actually true. Okay, so. Uh, um, uh, you know, quantum field theory is local. So thinking in position space is a really good idea. And uh, it's a perverted thing not to. Yes? So, but this, uh, this uh, accelerator observer can actually send a signal to the Minkowski observer saying that I don't see any value in this. But the Minkowski observer does see the value. Ah, right. And so, so actually, I, I leave that um, because my, my, my time is limited. I leave that. For, I, I leave it to you to work through all such 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 paradoxes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you will see that there is no such paradox, and it's all associated with these large redshifts associated. So, well, uh, let me answer the one that 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 that, that you said. Uh, let me answer the one that, that that you said already. So, so you want to say here's an Minkowski observer. They say, oh. I don't see any problem. I, I see a baryon. My barons are still here. But what happens in order for them to send a signal that the Rindler observer can see, okay, because of the incredible redshift, they have to send out an incredibly high frequency signal. And the energy in that high frequency signal destroys the baryons. <laughs> okay? So anyway, and there's answers like that to every such question. Okay? So um, uh, you know, this is something you guys are all used to, even from special relativity, right? In the end, there's a very simple formalism. You know the answer. Um, and then you can spend infinitely many time wandering through all the paradoxes. And it's fun for a while, and then it gets boring, because you know, you know that the answer is always going to work out. So it's very useful to get some intuition for why this is happening. But you know, we know the answer. I gave you some intuition. Now have fun and, and with, with all possible things that could, uh, uh, that, that, that could happen. But this is the essence of the physics. OK. <laughs> now, exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing happens with uh, black holes and disitter space. So let's talk about black holes. Oh, I should have said one trivial thing about uh, Rindler. Uh, the other way that you know people have people always have slick ways of deriving things after you know the answer. Okay. And so another way, another way that another way that, that, that people justify that Rindler space is a finite temperature is to say this is the metric of Rindler space. If you were to do a Euclidean rotation, t goes to i theta. Then it turns into rho squared d theta squared plus d rho squared. But unless theta is identified with 2 pi period, this space has a conical singularity. Okay? So the Euclidean time has got to be periodic. It's good to know arguments like this, and we'll use them. But you know, um, they don't really give you a feeling for what's going on. And I, I, I much prefer thinking. Uh, Anyway, it's fine. It just depends how smart you are, I guess. I'm just not smart enough to appreciate this. Um, OK, so now let's, uh, 
Did, did everyone understand this? It, it's just that the Euclidean time has got to be periodic with period 2 pi in order for there not to be a, a singularity in Euclidean space and therefore. But anyway, this argument, you see that this is, this really throw, actually this, this is important. Uh, this, this does bring up an important point. See, this space has a horizon, okay? And the full Minkowski space has a horizon. And there is a continuation of this metric across the horizon, which is just obviously, in this case, just Minkowski space, right? There's all of Minkowski space. And that's the analog of the Kruskal extension for the black hole uh, inside the black hole, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. But there's a way of extending this geometry. Uh, and it's all of Minkowski space. The Euclidean continuation does not include the rest of Minkowski space. The Euclidean continuation is really only a continuation of the outside and knows nothing about the inside. And that's one of the reasons, anyway, whereas the fact, the reason why there's thermality, the physical reason why there's thermality in the real Lorentzian theory is entanglement between one side and the other of the space. Whereas the Euclidean theory is just throwing out the other side and but therefore getting the same answer by making it thermal, OK? All right. Uh, I have two minutes, so let me just, hey, didn't you take two minutes? Uh, oh. OK, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't plan to take more time in the afternoon. Uh, but I had a bargain. Didn't I get another like hour or so here? No, I'm kidding. Uh, um, for the two minutes I gave up at the beginning. Um, all right. No, I'll just say something. Uh, I'll say something brief about black holes. In this city. And I want to stress that at the moment I'm not talking about actual gravity. I'm just I'm just talking about the, the field theory in these background space time. So specifically, I'm imagining a limit where I keep things like the Schwarzschild radius or the De Sitter radius fixed, and I send the G Newton to 0. There's no dynamical gravity. Okay. Okay. So the metric for a black hole that, and I'll only concentrate on the TR part. But actually, very generally, if you have a metric that looks like f of r plus dr squared over f of r, then around the neighborhood, so uh, suppose f of r looks like that. So somewhere it crosses 0. Okay. So it's some r star, it crosses 0. I want to describe what's going on uh, in the near horizon. It, so, so there's a horizon where f is equal to r star. And I want to describe what's going on close to the horizon. So let me do that by writing r is equal to r star plus something. Okay? And the something is going to be small. And furthermore, because for the moment I'm only interested in studying what's happening on this side, let me just make sure it's manifestly positive. So I'll put it plus rho squared. OK, so you see, uh, so I'm just making this, this, this change of variable. t I'm not touching. So the metric close to rho equals 0 then looks like what? ds squared looks like minus dt squared. Now f of r, if f looks like this, this is some f prime of r star times rho squared. And then dr squared over f of r looks like uh, d rho rho squared over f prime of r star rho squared. So the rho squareds cancel out. And this is equal to minus dt squared rho squared plus d rho squared with some f prime sprinkled in. So if I was smarter to begin with, I would have canceled out those uh, f primes. Uh, but anyway, you see that it's Rindler space. Okay. 
So the near horizon geometry of any, any metric with a horizon of this form is guaranteed to look like Riddler space. Of course, there's a good physical reason for that. Why is there a horizon? Because there's a force that's sucking you in somewhere. Okay? What do you have to do in order to avoid getting sucked in? You have to accelerate away. Okay? And if you're very close to the horizon, it's like the flat Earth approximation. Right? It's like we're very close to the Earth, so we can forget about the fact that it's, uh, that it's round, and it just looks like we're accelerating away in one direction. OK, so that's, there's a very good intuitive reason for that. Just parenthetically, there's only uh, one other possibility. The other possibility is when the function looks like that. It just kisses 0. And in that special case, what happens is that uh, in the neighborhood of r equals r star, uh, <coughs> both f is quadratic, and then this near horizon geometry is anti de Sitter space. So that's why ADS and Rindler are so ubiquitous. It's because the near horizon geometry of a generic horizon is Rindler space, and of extremal horizons is anti de Sitter space. OK. OK, now, um, so this is equally true of the Schwarzschild black hole. So close to the horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole, now the lines of constant rho are just the lines of constant R Schwarzschild. Okay? And the tau of Rindler space is just Schwarzschild time. Okay? So this is lines of constant R Schwarzschild. Okay. Of course, the black hole isn't exactly flat space. And so there's a continuation of this metric. And I won't have time to go through, although it's extremely simple, you've probably all seen it. Um, the continuation of this metric has the form that behind the horizon somewhere, at a distance here of order R Schwarzschild, there's a singularity. Okay. And also, Schwarzschild, the fact that the geometry is time translational invariant in this picture is, uh, I'm sorry, this is the, if we're talking about the eternal black hole, of course, there's a, there's a symmetrical singularity on the other side. Um, OK. And of course, this, it's only the near horizon geometry that looks like Rindler space. Very far away, uh, we asymptote to flat space. Now, we're talking here about the eternal black hole. So this is, this is the metric just of the, of the eternal black hole. Um, if I want to see what its thermality properties are, well, close to the horizon, it's totally obvious. I'm just seeing temperature 1 over rho. It's just exactly the same as in, uh, as in Endler space. Um, but uh, if I take this geometry, <coughs> Then nearby, I know that I have to make a, uh, if I work in R Schwarzschild equals one units, nearby, I know I have to make a, uh, if I go to Euclidean space, I have to make a 2 pi periodicity for t when I go to Euclidean space. Okay. So far away in Euclidean space, therefore, I have this metric just goes to the flat space metric in, uh, even in Euclidean space, because all the 1 over r's go away. Um, but I continue to have the 2 pi periodicity. So what the Euclidean geometry looks like, close to the horizon, it looks like the two-dimensional plane, okay, just like uh, Rindler space. But far away, it turns into a cylinder. 
So this is the near horizon geometry. Here's the two pi periodicity for, uh, for T. And that two pi periodicity for T turns into a two pi periodicity for T even very far away. And therefore, there's a temperature given by two pi, I think, over our Schwarzschild very far away. Now, what this means, so this is the Euclidean geometry corresponding to the eternal black hole. The Euclidean geometry for the eternal black hole has, is at finite temperature. So how are you supposed to interpret that? Uh, this is not Hawking radiation. This is not Hawking radiation. You're supposed to interpret this by saying that the only way to have this static eternal black hole is to have a non-zero temperature t at, in, at infinity. Okay. That means that if you did not have that temperature t at infinity, so but, but why is that physically? It's physically because the black hole is emitting radiation. So the only way to keep it static is to also heat things up at infinity to send the radiation back and keep it in equilibrium. Okay. Of course, it's not a stable equilibrium because black holes have negative specific heat. But anyway, just at the level of the, of the solution, this is the way you're supposed to interpret the answer. Okay? That for the static eternal geometry, you have to have temperature at infinity. What that means for actually making a physical black hole is that when you actually make a black hole, and it's not eternal, when you make a black hole, um, you're going to emit Hawking radiation. And you're going to emit radiation that at infinity looks like it has this temperature. Okay? But as, as I'll review uh, in the next lecture when we start talking about the uh, uh, information paradox, this temperature is reflecting the entanglement between things that fall into the black hole and the outside world. Okay? In exactly the same way that the Rindler temperature is reflecting the entanglement in the vacuum of field theory between one side and the other side of the horizon. Okay? And finally, we have exactly the same picture for the sitter space. Okay? The sitter space also has a metric of this form for the TR coordinates. F of R for the sitter space is equal to 1 minus r squared over L de Sitter squared. This is in the so-called static patch. Okay. So there's also some r at which, uh, there's also some r at which, um, anyway, it crosses 0. There's also entanglement between one side and the other of the horizon. Close to the de Sitter horizon, it looks exactly like Riddler space. Observers close to the horizon see a finite temperature. What's the difference between Riddler space and the black hole? Uh, in Riddler space, in, in the black hole, there's an outside, and in the sitter space, there is not. Okay? So the for, for me, for this observer, I look around and there's a horizon at a finite distance away. Over there, there's a temperature. Over there, there's a temperature. Everywhere around me, I'm surrounded by, a, by temperature. The temperature has no place to go. Okay? So, the, so I'm getting bombarded from all sides with a temperature. So that inside, in the center of the sitter space, I will measure a temperature given by, uh, again, 2 pi over L de Sitter, or Hubble. Okay. But now it's because I'm in the middle of this hot can. In the middle of this hot can, I'm getting bombarded by uh, all this radiation. And that radiation, again, is coming because I don't see the whole space. And what I see is uh, 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 what I see is entangled with things outside. And with respect to my natural Hamiltonian, it looks like the thing that I see is thermal. And in just the same way as in Rindler space, it's really physically thermal. Okay, everything that you might think is associated with temperature is is, is associated with this guy. Yes. Right. Right, right. That's right. That's right. So, Sorry? No, no, but 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 the, there's 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 entanglement between things. Uh, uh, so you're right. For 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 Rindler, we're talking about that little. We're, we're talking about that that region. Okay. In the case of the black hole, as we'll talk in a little more detail 
in the next lecture. It's entanglement between things here and things there. So there are other spatial slices. There are, these are the so-called nice slices, and we'll talk about them uh, in the next lecture. But it's, but it's indeed, it's again the same thing. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's again the same thing. All right, so let me just make one more comment, and now uh, uh, two more brief comments, and I'll let, 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 let you go. Um, OK. Uh, <coughs> um, Oh, comment number one is that uh, uh, it should be clear that this temperature, again, is associated with horizons. Um, so people say that accelerating observers see a temperature, and it's true in Rindler space. But it's not true for any old kind of acceleration. For example, if you're moving around in a circle, you're accelerating. You have uniform, well, not uniform magnitude acceleration. Okay, There's no temperature. <laughs> Obviously, there's no horizon. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing exciting going on. Okay? Whereas when you're uniformly accelerating in one direction, that's when you get a horizon because you can't see things and so on. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, I had something more interesting to say. But, uh, um, no, that's it. That's it. So, um, 